Habemus Papam. We have a new Pope. Habemus Papam. These words began in 1978, one of the longest pontificates in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. For the second time in only two months, the College of Cardinals had chosen a new leader. His name, Karol Yusef Wojtyła, Pope John Paul II. He was 58 years old when he became the 264th Pope. His appointment was a sensation. The first non-Italian Pope in 455 years, the first Slavic and the first Pope from a communist country. Without any doubt one of the most influential and also one of the most controversial figures, Pope John Paul II has built bridges between nations, cultures and religions like no other Pope before him. In order to understand how this Pope has redefined the role of the Catholic Church in the world, one must take a close look at his heritage. Karol Yusef Wojtyła was born on May 18, 1920 in Wadowice, Poland, the son of an administrative officer in the Polish army and a former school teacher. Karol was an ambitious child. At the age of 10, he starts learning German at 13, Latin, and at 14, Greek. By the time he became pontiff, he spoke eight languages, a skill that has helped him connect with the people throughout his life. Was it just coincidence or destiny that Karol Wojtyła's birthplace was only one block away from the local place of worship? Kostielna, Church Road, a road that he first crossed on June 20th, 1920 on his way to be baptized and a road that he should follow for the rest of his life. Today, Carol's birthplace is a museum visited by thousands of people from all over the world every year. Looking down from one wall of the room where baby Carol was born, the portraits of his mother and his father. Throughout the building, the walls are covered with hundreds of photographs documenting every stage of the life of a man who has touched so many and whose memory will linger forever in our hearts. His friends remembered Karol Wojtyła as an intelligent, friendly, and sociable man. When he did not lose himself in his book studies, which was the case most of the time, he enjoyed playing soccer, skiing, kayaking, swimming, and hiking. His passion for the great outdoors has not left him until the end of his life, and it is a testimonial to the deep connection that this man felt to nature and God. In 1938, Karol Wojtyła leaves Wadowice and enrolls at the Krakow University to study Polish philology. He lived in a house that belonged to his mother's family, the Kaczorowskis. Carol had always been interested in literature and for a while even thought about becoming a professional actor. While still in high school in Wadowice, he had been involved in school theater and had performed leading roles in several plays. September 1st, 1939, the German army invaded Poland. 
Only 27 days later, Poland surrendered. The Germans closed all universities and even tried to impose the use of German as the official language. On November 6, the teachers of the Jagiellonian University, who had tried to keep the institution open, were deported by the Nazis. Thus, the Holy Father's studies in Polish philology ended after only one year. In order to keep his work permit and therefore avoid the German manhunts, Wojciewa worked as a stonecutter for the Solvay factory. During these hard years, he became even more involved in theater work, writing plays and putting up secret forbidden performances. He also felt more and more drawn to what should be the mission of his life. In 1942, one year after his father's death and while the war was still raging, Karol Wojciewa began studying theology. He was only 21 years old when he decided that he wanted to become a priest. The Nazis did not allow the training of new priests, so Wojtyla had to conduct his studies in secret. He kept his job as a stonecutter for Solvay, but in an effort to help him out, the management transferred him from the quarry where he used to work to the factory itself. A bronze plaque mounted on the wall of the main building is a silent reminder of these dark days. The Archbishops of Yeha had set up a secret seminary, and from 1944, Karol was given a room at the Archbishop's Palace in Krakow. Here he studied in hiding until the war was over in 1945. The following year, on November 1st, 1946, Karol Wojtyla was ordained as a priest. The Soviet communism had man's liberation from slavery and oppression written on its banners, but wherever it came to power, it only established yet another totalitarian dictatorship. For Karol Wojtyla, who had worked in communist Poland as a priest and bishop, the conflict between the communist idea and how it was put into practice became a determinant factor in his life. In the 1940s, still interested in theater, he dealt with this conflict in a play, comparing the answers of Marxism and Christianity. In this play appears a political agitator whose character is inspired by well, Lenin. put it differently, that you have rights, human rights, but you are being denied those rights. Who denies us those rights? Who? There isn't one single person. One has to expose whole groups of people, one by one. The worst thing is... His antagonist is also unjust. based on a historical character, Adam Schmalowski, a Polish artist who always selflessly stood up for the poor. The Marxist wants to lead the worker to freedom by means of revolution. His opponent preaches that a Christian must recognize Christ in every human being and that only the mercy of Jesus Christ alone can lead to true freedom. His tireless efforts in challenging this political system, that throughout history has failed time again and again, should decades later influence world events in ways nobody could ever have foreseen. Without a doubt, Pope John Paul II has played a significant role in the process leading to the foundation of the Free Union Solidarność which laid the groundwork in Poland's transition from a communist regime to a democracy. The events in Poland would lead to the fall of the Berlin Wall in December of 1989 and ultimately to the breakup of the Soviet Empire. Unlike in Poland, the Catholic Church in South America did not demonstrate the same unity when it came to fighting political oppression and economical exploitation. The Pope pointed out that the Church had to take sides with the poor when he visited the grave of Archbishop Romero, who had paid for his engagement for human rights with his life. 
cheerful crowds of hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes even millions, came to hear his message. But the church in Latin America was at odds with itself, split up and divided. One part defended the violence of the government, while the other defended the violence of the revolutionists. The Pope expressed solidarity with the poor, but demanded non-violence and loyalty to Rome. Neither riots nor bomb threats could keep him from bringing his message of hope and showing his support to all the people who were waiting for him. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to believe and to confess to your belief. Even when the world around you is hostile and ignorant to the gospel. Arrival in another third world continent. The many journeys that Pope John Paul II had undertaken in order to bring his message to the people had often taken him to Africa. As everywhere he went, cheerful crowds gathered to welcome him. Devastating droughts, hunger and disease, poverty and tribal wars have shaken this continent for decades. We should not wait for dryness to become frightful and devastating. We should not wait for death caused by the sun. We should not allow that the future of the African people keeps being under threat. The Pope had always spoken out against injustice and human rights violations. Recognizing and admitting past errors has always been a main priority for him. In 1992, he visited the House of the Slaves in Gore, a small island off the coast of Senegal. From here, over 15 million Africans were once transported to America as slaves. From this African sanctuary of black despair, we shall invoke the forgiveness of heaven. We pray so that in the future the disciples of Christ will prove themselves totally faithful to the commandments of brotherly love. Because I used to live in a land which had to fight for its independence and freedom, a land that was subject to the aggression of its neighbors, I can relate to the suffering of the third world countries, which are also subjected to a kind of dependence. Another kind, the economical dependence. I have experienced what exploitation means, and I have uncompromisingly taken the side of the poor, the disinherited, the oppressed, the segregated, and the defenseless. We miners from Katavi want you to wear this helmet and be one of us, says a worker from Katavi. Help us fight to reopen the mine, Holy Father. This letter is from the unfortunate communities in Katavi, Holy Father. We believe in God. Our lives are full of fear, desperation, and pain, but also full of faith and hope because we believe in God.
the path of the church must lead to the people is one of the guidelines of this pope. Man cannot live without love. He will never be able to find himself and his life will be meaningless if he does not experience love, if he does not receive love, if love has no place within him, if he does not participate in love with all his heart. This Pope, who always and wherever he went stood up for the helpless and the suffering, encountered helplessness and pain himself. It happened on May 13, 1981, in St. Peter's Square during the weekly public audience that was being held every Wednesday. As the Pope moved through the square in a convertible at slow speed, he became the target of a cold-blooded assassination attempt. The 23-year-old Turkish terrorist Mehmet Ali Agsha fired several rounds at the pontiff before the eyes of 20,000 terrified people who had gathered to attend the event, three bullets hit John Paul II, one of them barely missing the abdominal artery. Doctors were able to save his life during a six-hour operation but the Pope had to remain hospitalized for 55 days, but even after his recovery never completely regained his almost athletic strength. Pope John Paul II gave a very personal sign of forgiveness in 1983 when he visited the man who once tried to kill him. He has always kept their conversation secret. Only what grows on the fields of reconciliation will bear fruit. But not only was this Pope open to forgive, he also asked for forgiveness. The Pope's historic Mia Culpa in the Holy Year 2000 revealed a different church. A church which was able to admit mistakes and willing to ask others for forgiveness. A church that admitted its wrongdoings and mistreatment of people, such as the 16th century mathematician and astronomer, Galileo Galilei, whose findings about the universe had been denied by the Church for centuries, or the Bohemian theologist Jan Hus, who was burned at the stake in 1415 for his criticism of the Church. One of the things that characterized Pope John Paul II is his relationship with young people. Even after the institution of World Youth Day in 1983 in Rome, he kept reaching out to young people around the world. In September 1987 in Santiago, the capital of Chile, he spoke to a crowd of youngsters and suggested the right path for them to follow, encouraging them to live the gospel and in a spirit of evangelization reach out to their peers. Throughout his travels around the globe, visiting six continents, it became clear that the influence of this Pope is to be felt for generations to come. He was most certainly the most important Pope of all time. 
Never before has one man united as many people as John Paul II. We have to choose a new life in Jesus Christ. He is life. He is the truth. He is the way to follow. In 1991, he welcomed young people from all over the world in Chestachova for the Sanctuary of the Black Virgin. Since the Berlin Wall had fallen just two years prior to this event, youngsters from numerous Eastern European countries were now able to join him for the first time. In 1995, he celebrated the 10th anniversary of World Youth Day in Manila. Three million people joined in for the event, causing chaos in the center of the city. The Filipino authorities tried to encourage people to stay at home with little success. Pope John Paul II always had a great appreciation for the arts. He believed that those who were fortunate enough to be blessed with the divine spark of an artistic talent, whether it was as a sculptor or painter, poet or writer, architect, actor or musician, are obligated not to waste this talent, but rather to put it into God's service. All true artists share the same experience that everything they are able to express, painting, carving, composing and sculpting, that the greatest masterpieces that their hands are able to create are nothing but a pale gleam of the divine brilliance which for a short moment fleshed up before their eyes. Vorrei approfittare di questa occasione I would like to take advantage of this occasion and bring you wishes for the now imminent Christmas festivities. Via the television come my warm thoughts to all those who came together for this manifestation and for which I give a special apostolic blessing. 
con una speciale benedizione apostolica. And with pleasure I extend this to all your dear ones and all those that via the television take part in this event of great musical interest. Merry Christmas. Can one serve God and the arts at the same time? Christ says you cannot be servant to two masters. I believe that serving the arts is always like a service to false gods. Unless you do it like Mrs. Angelico and devote your whole art, talent, and thinking to the glory of God. And your painting to the Holy One alone? Pope John Paul II had a reputation for being the traveling pope. He understood his pontificate as a pilgrimage to the people. Today it is hard to imagine that at one time the leaders of the Catholic Church lived retreated in grandiose palaces and traveled in noble palanquins. During the time of his pontificate, John Paul II spent over 800 days traveling. He went on more than 240 trips that took him to well over 1,000 cities in six continents. The distance he traveled in order to bring his message to the world amounts to 1.2 million kilometers. That is 3.2 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Needless to say that this kind of strain can become a little bit exhausting at times. But for the traveling Pope, no way was too far, no ocean too big and no river too deep when it came to carrying God's message out into the world.
using any kind of transportation and oftentimes even exposing himself to life-threatening danger, he was truly the people's pope. As yet another attribute to his pontificate, Pope John Paul II has canonized and beatified more people during his time in office than any pope in the 2,000 years before him, always driven by the desire to show God's presence. The divine mercy was one of the guiding ideas for John Paul II. He followed modern mystics like Sister Faustina Kowalska, who he canonized in the year 2000, and teachers like Teresa von Avila. Saints are not superhuman beings. They are sinners who dare to trust in God people who opened themselves up to God's saving power. One of the main focal points of Pope John Paul's pontificate was the ecumenical dialogue. He always felt saddened by the fact that the Church was not able to enter the third millennium in unity. In his view, the split of the Church contradicted everything Jesus had constituted. During its thousand-year-old history, Poland has been a country of many different nationalities and of many Christian and non-Christian confessions. This tradition accounts for the fact that the Polish people are open-minded towards people who think differently, speak a different language, and worship the same God with different prayers and celebrations. For they shall be one, is the title of the papal writing addressing the ecumenical dialogue. In it, he called upon all Christians to come together and to be united in their faith. The dialogue with the Orthodox churches was of special concern to Pope John Paul. He understood that unity also required openness on the side of Rome. Although the path might be long and exhausting, it is a path that must be walked. One of the darkest chapters in history, and up until today an open wound, is the relationship between the Church and Judaism. It wasn't until the Second Vatican Council in 1965 that the Church ended the theological condemnation of the Jews. Over 2,000 bishops from all over the world gathered in Rome at that time. Karol Wojtyła, who was appointed resident Archbishop of Krakow only one year earlier, was one of them. He has helped to shape this council. Pope John Paul II 
who had witnessed the terrors of the Nazi regime in his native Poland, where millions of Jews died in the concentration camps, made the dialogue and reconciliation with the Jews a main focal point of his pontificate. In 1986, he became the first pope in history to visit a Jewish synagogue. At this occasion, he greeted the Jews as older brothers in faith, a breakthrough in Catholic-Jewish relations. The Church deplores all the hatred, persecution and manifestation of anti-Semitism that have been directed at some point by someone against the Jews. Another milestone in Jewish-Christian relations his pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the year of the Great Jubilee 2000. With confidence and faith, John Paul II had overcome the numerous political obstacles that were thrown in his way in order to realize this difficult mission. Consistently, he pushed for peace between the religions by means of communication, symbolic gestures, and silent prayer. He came as a pilgrim to Jerusalem and placed his prayer, according to Jewish tradition, in the cracks of the Wailing Wall. Without reservation, John Paul II also approached the third monotheistic religion, Islam. His pontificate brought a new dimension into the relations between the Catholic and the Islamic world. Unlike certain Christian fundamentalists, he attached great importance to the common elements of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. One of the key events was his speech before Islamic youngsters in the Casablanca Stadium in 1985. As always, John Paul II mesmerized the crowd not only with his presence, but even more so with the message he brought when he referred to Abraham as the common forefather of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. With his initiative, he challenged the thesis of the unavoidable clash of the cultures and emphasized the unity of all people who are willing to live the good life. But his efforts to unite did not stop there. In 1986 and 2002, the Pope invited representatives of the world's religions to pray for peace to Assisi. He wanted to put the power of reconciliation up against the threat to world peace through hunger, poverty, and the arms race. The Pope sought the dialogue. Without compromising his own theological position, he met the other ideological leaders with openness and respect. The Catholic Church does not reject any of what is true and holy in all these other religions. We should not be surprised that God allows such multitude of religions but celebrate the many common elements which are reflected in all of them. Meeting the world with such openness requires, on the other hand, strong unity within. True dialogue can only take place when one's own convictions are built on a solid foundation.
and the Pope's mission is primarily to serve the Catholic Church, to guard its global hierarchical order, and to ensure the purity of its teachings. He is the cornerstone of a building which has to withstand considerable tension. Together with his right hand, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, the Pope tried to strengthen the identity of the Catholic Church by reinforcing its authority in all disputed issues. In 1998, Pope John Paul followed one of the many invitations of President Fidel Castro and made a historic visit to Cuba. At the airport, he was welcomed by Castro, who in order to honor the Pope, had traded his usual uniform for a suit. As always, a crowd of people had gathered to give Pope John Paul a warm reception. During his visit, the Pope gave several speeches in which he condemned prostitution and the practice of abortion. He also took a position against socialist education and emphasized the importance of family values. In front of the Palace of the Revolution, John Paul II asked Fidel Castro to give amnesty to 500 political prisoners. One month later, 300 were set free. In Havana, the cradle of the Cuban Revolution, the Pope gave a speech in which he condemned capitalism because in his point of view, it puts forward the markets before the interest of the people. But he also condemned the Marxist ideology, because it accounts for many social problems and diminishes religion to a personal problem. When his speech was received with standing ovations, the Pope's response revealed his great sense of humor. I love your applause because it gives me a chance to rest. Not long after Pope John Paul had returned from Cuba, he was visited by Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State under the Clinton administration. She announced that in response to the release of Cuban prisoners, the United States would lift some of its sanctions against Cuba. Another face of the Pope's relationship with world leaders. In the Vatican, at the audience of the Pope, the authorities of the world have considered major problems of our time. Here, he welcomes Bill Clinton and his wife Hillary in a papal audience. Jacques Chirac, the Prime Minister of France, has also visited the Pope on several occasions. Chancellor Helmut Kohl of the Federal Republic of Germany. Egypt. 
and Fidel Castro, whose audience with the Pope was a historic event. It was on that occasion that the Holy Father accepted Castro's invitation to Cuba. Nelson Mandela, welcoming the Pope at the airport in Johannesburg in South Africa. which is only three quarters the size of the mall in Washington, D.C. A state that has only one TV station, no airport, and no highways. But then again, its population is only less than 1,000 people. As the head of the Vatican, the Pope holds the legislative, the executive, and judicial power. He is the man in charge. For almost three decades, it has been the home of Pope John Paul II. His guiding light will shine forever.